Well, hello there. This is Cliff Searcy, and we come to you at the beginning of this new year with a new edition of Music and the Word with the Searcy's. And we're going to be talking about an interesting subject, at least I hope it's interesting to you. It's called Now, What's Next? We'll get into that in just a few minutes, but first we're going to sing a song for you. It's called Lord Lift Me Up to Higher Ground. I'm pressing on the upward way, new heights I'm gaining every day, still praying as I'm onward bound, Lord plant my feet on higher ground, my heart has no desire to stay, where doubts arise. As we enter this brand new year, let's remember that we have a friend in Jesus that the scriptures tell us sticketh closer than a brother. We, the Searchies, are going to sing this beautiful song, beautiful hymn, What a Friend We Have in Jesus.
My message title is now, what's next? Where do we go from here? Do you make any New Year's resolutions? My only real New Year's resolution that I started making years ago was that I wasn't going to make any New Year's resolutions. And I pretty much hung on to that and have, have kept, um, kept that practice up here the last several years. Because, I mean, people make New Year's resolutions and they keep them for hours, you know. And so um, I just really want to make changes in my life that are going to count, you know, <laughs> not just because I want to turn over a new leaf. But uh, I saw something interesting on the Internet. Uh, a friend of mine, he uh, posted his New Year's resolutions and I thought they were kind of interesting. You ought to hear what he had to say. He said, this year I want to be more like Jesus. Number one, I want to hang out with sinners. Number two, I want to upset religious people. Number three, I want to tell stories that make people think. Number four, I want to choose unpopular friends. Number five, he said, I want to be kind, loving, and merciful. And I really like number six. He wants to be like Jesus. He said, number six, I want to take naps on boats. Yeah, okay. <laughs> well, uh, good luck, my good friend. <laughs> And I trust that uh, your resolutions will come to pass and your goals will be reached this year. But really, what is next? What do we do? So many people are just so sad. Uh, there's been a lot of loss. Some of that's been from COVID-19. Some of that's been just from uh, other folks that have gone on to meet the Lord or the loss of businesses or, or other things that have happened. Uh, we lost a lot of family members and friends this past year. There have been so many folks, and gospel music folks that were friends of ours, that we had the privilege of meeting and visiting with, passed away this past year. It's been sad. We've lost friends, and we've lost people very, very dear to us. People have lost jobs. We're still dealing with the hurt and the pain of folks that have left us. Well, it kind of makes you kind of think, where do we go from here? How do we go on? What's the next step? What do we do next? Where do we go from here? Well, I was thinking about uh, the prophet Samuel and an uh, interesting thing that happened in his life and in the life of David and in the life of King Saul. Remember that, that King Saul meant an awful lot to Samuel the prophet because it was Samuel the prophet that God used to anoint King Saul. Remember that? King Saul was only 30 years old when he became king, and he ruled for 42 years. He ruled until he died at age 72. 42 years he ruled. And Samuel had seen the many things that Saul had done over the years that really weren't the way they should have been. And it hurt him because like many pastors, like many preachers, he was rooting for Saul. He was rooting for him. Oh, as a pastor, I've seen folks in my church that have struggled. I've seen young people and even middle-aged and older people and, and, and young adults that have made poor choices over and over and over again. And I've just agonized as I've said, oh, why did you have to do that? Why did you have to make that move? That's not what I hoped you were going to do. And I've prayed and I've agonized. Why? Because I wasn't condemning them. That's not what a pastor does. I was rooting for them. I was saying, come on, you can make it, you can do it, you can be better than that. I was just rooting for them like I would root for my own kids. And it was sad to me when I saw that they failed. Well, 1 Samuel chapter 13 tells the awful story of what happened when Saul went too far and God said, that is enough. Samuel made it clear that Saul was to wait at a certain place and Saul was interested. The king wanted Samuel to come and offer some burnt offerings because there was a battle that was going to come up with the Philistines and he wanted to be sure that God's blessing would be upon it. And he said, it's very, very important that I have these burnt offerings offered to the Lord before I go into battle. And Samuel said, don't worry about it. You wait there. And on the seventh day, I will be there. You wait for me. Now you understand that there was the role of a prophet and a priest and the role of a king. A prophet or a priest was enabled and had the ability to properly, under God, offer burnt sacrifices. And they offered them to God on the behalf of others. But the king didn't have the ability to do that. The king would have been intruding into the priestly and prophet 
office. He did not have the right or the ability or the authority to do such a thing. And Samuel said, I'll take care of it. I will be there. Samuel was a man of his word. But it tells us in 1 Samuel chapter 13 about Saul, that Saul waited seven days, the time set by Samuel, but Samuel did not come to Gilgal, and Saul's men began to scatter. So Saul said, bring me the burnt offering and the fellowship offerings, and Saul offered up the burnt offering. Uh-oh, that was a no-no. He wasn't supposed to do that. He wasn't allowed to do that. That was an absolute affront to God. That was an insult to God. That was a action that said, God, I don't care what your rules are. I don't care what the proper protocol should be. I'm going to do what I want to do, and that's just how it's going to be, God. You don't do that. We don't ever get God over a barrel. We never get in a situation where we dictate to God what we're going to do. The best thing we can do is to understand what he wants us to do and fall in line and obey what he says. And so he offered the burnt offerings. And just as he finished making the offering in verse 10, Samuel arrives and Saul went out to greet him. <laughs> well, Samuel says to him, Saul, what have you done? And Saul replied, well, I saw the men were scattering, that you did not come at the set time. Now the Philistines will come down against me at Gilgal, and I have not sought the Lord's favor. So I felt compelled to offer the burnt offering. I couldn't help it. It wasn't my fault. I felt compelled to do it. I didn't have a choice. It had to be done. You weren't here on time. What's the matter? Your watch didn't work or something? You didn't get here when you were supposed to. Not true. He said, I'll be there on the seventh day. And he showed up just as Saul was finishing the offering of that burnt offering. So Saul is looking him right in the face and lying to Samuel, lying to him, saying, you weren't here on time. But the fact that he shows up just as the offering is being completed made it very, very clear that he was there on the seventh day and in enough time that he could have offered the offering. I felt compelled. I couldn't. I had to fix your mistakes, Samuel. I had to step in and do something because you weren't where you were supposed to be. And it's not my fault. It's your fault. Boy, that really impressed Samuel. <laughs> no, it didn't. It didn't impress God either. And then Samuel prophesies over him and tells him in verse 13, you acted foolishly. You have not kept the command the Lord your God gave you. If you had... He would have established your kingdom over Israel for all time. For all time. But now your kingdom will not endure. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart and appointed him leader of his people because you have not kept the Lord's command. Because of what happened there, God said, that's it, you've gone too far. I've given you chance after chance after chance. And he prophesied through Samuel, your kingdom is going to be taken away from you. It would have been established for all time if you had just obeyed me, but you didn't obey me. And so as a result, I'm taking your kingdom away and I'm giving it to somebody else who's a person after my own heart. How would you like to have a message like that? What would you feel like if you were Saul? And that's what got delivered to you. Crushing. But it not only crushed Saul. It also crushed Samuel. Because Samuel kind of felt like the pastor of Saul. He was the one that was his advisor. He was the one that was looking out for him. He was rooting for him. And so his heart was broken over this. So much so that he just kind of sat down and did nothing. He kind of got stuck in the rut, so to speak. He kind of just got to where he just wasn't doing much of anything. He wasn't productive. He was just sitting at home mourning and grieving and just, he, he just wasn't active. You ever feel like that? Have you felt like that the last few weeks? Have you dealt with that kind of a thing yourself? just kind of stuck in a rut right now and you just haven't really gotten up and gotten going yet in verse samuel chapter 16 god catches up with samuel now listen to this he says to samuel how long will you mourn for saul since i have rejected him as king over israel fill your horn with oil and be on your way i'm sending you to jesse of bethlehem i've chosen one of his sons to be king samuel get up and get to work 
Get productive. You've just sat around upset about what has happened in the past too long, and I've let you grieve and mourn for a while, but that's past. It's time to get up and get going. Get productive. Do something. Get back into action. Get back into the fight. I got a job for you. I want you to be productive. I'm sending you to Jesse. One of his sons is going to be king. You know the story. Verse 4 of 1 Samuel 16, Samuel does exactly what God tells him to do, and he heads over to Jesse's house and finds out where that is. And uh, when they arrive, Samuel sees Eliab and thinks, wow, look at this son. Surely the Lord's anointing stands here before the Lord. Look at this guy. And the Lord says to Samuel, don't consider his appearance or his height, for I've rejected him. The Lord does not look at things the way man looks at them. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Yeah, he had chosen somebody that was a person after his own heart. So Jesse calls another son. He calls Abinadab and had him pass in front of Samuel. But Samuel said, the Lord has not chosen this one either. And then Shammah passes by. No, oh, not that one. Jesse had seven of his sons pass before Samuel. But Samuel said to him, the Lord has not chosen any of these. So he asked Jesse, is these all the sons you have? Because he was thinking, God told me that one of his sons was going to be the one that was chosen. And he's, all of his sons have evidently passed before me, but God has said no, 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 no to each and every one. He says, isn't there another son? He goes, well, there's this little boy, the youngest. He's tending the sheep. He says, send for him. I'm not going to sit down, and I'm not going to get back to doing anything until he arrives. And so in verse 12, Jesse sends and has him brought in. He was ruddy with a fine appearance and handsome features. The Lord said, rise and anoint him. He is the one. Of course, we're talking about David. So Samuel takes the horn of oil and anoints David in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the spirit of the Lord comes upon David in power. And Samuel goes up to Ramah. Now the spirit of the Lord had departed from Saul and the evil spirit from the Lord tormented him. What's that talking about? An evil spirit from the Lord. Saul was under conviction and God allowed Saul to be under conviction. And so he was tormented, tormented. And the way it explains it in scripture, it calls it in, in the translation from the original Hebrew, it's calling it an evil spirit from the Lord. But what it really is, is conviction that was coming from the Lord upon him. And he had no rest. How uncomfortable people have been for years sitting in church, sitting on the back row, just sitting there under conviction. Relatives of ours, family, friends, that see the way that we live. You know, the scripture tells us to let our light so shine before men that they may see our good works and glorify our Father which is in heaven. And when we do that, it sometimes brings conviction. It sometimes brings a reproof. It sometimes brings different messages to people that causes them to understand that the way that they're living is not the way that God wants them to. So he says... Find somebody who plays well and bring him to me. Let me get some music in the house here. Music will soothe me. And so Saul says, find somebody. And one of the servants says, hey, I've seen a son of Jesse of Bethlehem who knows how to play the harp. He's a brave man and a warrior, speaks well, is a fine-looking man, and the Lord is with him. And so Saul sends his messengers to Jesse, says, send me your son David who's with the sheep. And so Jesse takes a donkey, loads it with bread and a skin of wine and a young goat, and sends them with David to Saul. And Saul liked him very much. And so he entered the service of Saul and David became one of his armor bearers. And he sends a message to Jesse, Saul does, and says, allow David to remain in my service for I am pleased with him. Well, you know the rest of the story. <laughs> when Saul began to realize that David was the one that God was going to replace him with eventually, all of a sudden, he becomes public enemy number one. He throws a spear at him one day in his fit of madness and rage. David takes off on the run. He becomes public enemy number one, like I said. He's hunted down to where Saul's even leading the army, going after him over and over and over again. And this continues until the day that Saul dies at the age of 72, and he's no longer the king. Now, fasten your seatbelt. When was it? that God sent Samuel to go visit Jesse and look for the one that was going to be anointed the king, David. Well, David was a young man 
not old enough clearly by the rest of the story to go f- actually serve in the military he was too young to go out on the battlefield with his brothers against the philistines he was too young so we know he was much less than 20 years old he was about 17 as far as we can tell 17 years old and samuel anoints him to be the king but he's 17 years old so he knows at that point He's going to be the king one day. And so does Jesse and so do his brothers. They didn't really believe it, but that's what they were told because they were witness to the anointing by the prophet. You know how old David was when he became king? He was 30 years old. 30. So about 13 years went by from the time that David was anointed to be king by the prophet And when he actually became the king, 13 years where David was aware of what God had said, and so was his family, but just waiting for God to bring that to pass. And so many times he had the opportunity to try to take matters into his own hands, and he refused to do that. The point of my story is this. Samuel was so discouraged over the fact that the one he was rooting for was rejected by God. Saul had been totally rejected by God for what he had done. That he became where he was so in a depression and mourning and grieving that he was not of any use to himself or to God or to anybody else. He ceased to be productive and God said, pick yourself up and quit grieving. You've grieved long enough. I've got a job for you to do. And so All of a sudden, he does one of the most important things he did in his own entire ministry, his own entire life, anointing David to be the king of Israel 13 years before it happened. Turns out by history to be one of the most significant and important things that Samuel ever did. There was more work ahead for Samuel. It was a great thing that happened. God used him in a mighty way to bring God's greatest king to Israel. Wow. Almost missed it. If he didn't obey God, if he didn't pick himself up and and go back on working again, wow. He would have just sat there in, in his lack of being productive and maybe he would have withered away. But he picked himself up and said, okay, I'm going to I'm going to get back to work. I'm going to get back to work. And so he put his discouragement aside and got back to work. Kind of reminds me of some of the things that Paul the Apostle said. Philippians chapter 3, Paul said, Forgetting those things which are behind, reaching forth into those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. What do you mean forgetting those things which are behind? Oh, Paul had so many regrets. It was Paul that really came against the early Christians before he knew Jesus really was the Messiah and before he worshiped Jesus, it was Paul that put many of the folks to death that served Jesus and actually gave his approval to others that were putting them to death. Remember when he found the Lord, he was on his way 132 miles from Jerusalem to Damascus over in Syria to go and grab Christians, take them out of their houses and he wanted to bind them in chains and ropes and march them 132 32 miles back through all of that area so that he could send the message to all the Christians. Don't think you can get away. You can go 132 miles away, but I'll find you. I'll track you down. I'll get you and I'll parade you right back through the whole countryside so that everyone will be terrorized. Yeah, he was a terrorist. He really was. That whole stunt of going to Damascus, it was to put terror in the hearts of the Christians to try to get them to stop serving Jesus. Did you ever know that? Were you aware of that? But take a look at this. He had those regrets. How many people were put to death? Wow. He said, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. And his message is very, very appropriate for you today. You made mistakes. You may have made them for many, many years. 
and you say, I can't get it fixed. I can't forget what I've done. I can't shirk the past. I can't escape from the awful, terrible things that I did. Well, how many people have you murdered? How many families have you broken up? How many people wound up being orphans because of what you did? And yet, even though Paul had done these things, look at how wonderfully God was able to use him. He learned how to forget those things which were behind and go forward. And you can too. Yes, you can. You can do that. You can do that right now. God wants to forgive you for everything you've done that displeased him and allow him to come into your life, be your best friend, and forgive you of all of your sins. Let's pray together. I pray with this one, dear Lord, that in their heart are saying, Lord, forgive me. I've made mistakes, but I want to reach out to you and I want to see you make a change in my life. Forgive me of my sins. Let me live for you. Be my best friend. Assure me of a home in heaven and I will live for you. We thank you, Jesus. Hear the prayer of this person that's prayed that today. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for praying that prayer with me. I really appreciate that. And I hope you'll be with us again. We're going to be right here at the same place you found us next week. I hope you come back and you come with us again, okay? And you listen to the message and the music next week on Music and the Word with the Circes. 